Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Wildlife Fertility Control State of the Field webinar. I'm your host, Stephanie Boyles Griffin, the Science and Policy Director for the Botstever Institute for Wildlife Fertility Control. In August 2016, the Institute was launched as a partnership between the Dietrich W. Botstever Foundation and the Humane Society of the United States. The Institute aims to advance the use of sustainable, non-lethal fertility control methods to manage wildlife populations worldwide through our three major program areas, events, education, and grants. Specifically, we serve as a resource center for wildlife fertility control by organizing conferences, workshops, symposiums, and seminars to stimulate vital discussion, collaboration, and networking, providing grants to support projects that advance the science and policies associated with wildlife fertility control and its practical applications, and educating wildlife managers, policymakers, and the public. For more information about the Institute, please be sure to visit our website at www.wildlifefertilitycontrol.org. To get started, I'd like to provide you with some context on how the field of wildlife fertility control came to be. As many of you well know, human populations are expanding worldwide, and as they do, conflicts between humans and wildlife have increased exponentially, including damage to crops, forests, and private property, the transmission of zoonotic disease, increased competition between native and non-native species, road and air traffic collisions, livestock depredation, and even attacks on humans. Up until recently, efforts to resolve these conflicts focused primarily on lethal population management methods, including, but not limited to, culls with firearms, archery equipment, traps, snares, and toxicants. But in the 20th century, in response to growing human health and safety, animal welfare, and environmental concerns associated with the use of these traditional lethal management practices, wildlife managers and researchers began exploring the use of non-lethal methods to mitigate human-wildlife conflicts. For example, wildlife managers use strategically designed fencing to exclude wildlife from areas of concern. They use aversive conditioning repellents to prevent wildlife from foraging on crops and desirable plants. They translocate wildlife away from areas of low tolerance to areas of high tolerance. They use diversionary feeding tactics to lure wildlife away from areas of concern. The aforementioned methods and others can be used alone, but are typically more effective when used in combination with one another as part of an integrated approach to reducing wildlife conflicts. Finally, as part of an integrated approach, wildlife managers are starting to incorporate fertility control methods into existing management programs to stabilize and, when necessary, reduce wildlife populations over time. The steady rise in public demand for the use of non-lethal methods to resolve conflicts with wildlife is one of the major forces driving current advancements in the field of wildlife fertility control. Another is the need to provide wildlife managers with alternatives to lethal wildlife damage management methods in situations where lethal methods may be illegal, socially or politically unacceptable, infeasible, unsustainable, environmentally hazardous, or ineffective. We say or because in many cases, one or more of the aforementioned factors may apply to the same wildlife management issue and prevent a wildlife manager from using any lethal method to manage a particular wildlife population. An obvious fertility control option is surgical sterilization using methods such as ovariectomies or removal of ovaries and tubal ligations on females and vasectomies on males. Here we see photos of veterinarians performing ovariectomies on white-tailed deer does in the U.S. and a vasectomy on an African elephant bull. The upside is that the procedures are generally permanent, which means the animal will no longer be able to reproduce and will also not have to be located and handled again. The downside is that some procedures are more invasive than others, which comes with inevitable risks to the individual animal's welfare. Also, most surgical procedures are not reversible, which may not be optimal for wildlife managers who are concerned about, for instance, the long-term genetic viability of a wildlife population. 
For these reasons, researchers began to work to develop fertility control agents that could be widely used to manage wildlife in situations when it was necessary and appropriate to do so. In the process, they also identified key attributes that would make for an ideal fertility control agent should they be successful in developing one. An ideal agent should be effective in most animals. It should be able to be administered remotely without having to handle the animal physically, either by oral administration or by remote delivery by syringe dart. In most cases, it would be optimal if it was reversible, but in some situations, depending on management goals for a particular wildlife population, a chemical sterilant may be preferable. It depends. It should be safe to use in animals that are already pregnant and should have no impact on developing fetuses. It should have no significant side effects on individual animals, physical, behavioral, or otherwise. It should not pass through the food chain, meaning it should have no impact if the flesh of a treated animal were to be consumed by a non-target animal. And finally, the cost to produce and administer the agent should be relatively low. Over the last 10 years, several wildlife fertility control agents have been registered in the U.S. and elsewhere. One class of fertility control agents are commonly referred to as immunocontraceptives. These agents are vaccines that induce the production of antibodies against proteins or hormones essential for reproduction. For example, the porcine zona pellucida, or PZP vaccine, and the gonacon vaccine have both been registered by the Environmental Protection Agency for the management of wild equids and cervids in the U.S. The EPA has also registered two oral wildlife contraceptives, ovocontrol for pigeons and other bird species, and contrapest for commensal rodents. In order to administer these agents to target species in real-world situations, researchers have developed delivery systems and standard operating procedures for using them in concert with the development of these agents. For oral contraceptives, applicators use specially designed feeders that allow only the target species to access the treated bait. On the right is an oral contraceptive bait dispenser for gray squirrels, in the center is a bait dispenser for pigeons on the rooftop of a commercial building, and to the left is a dispenser for wild pigs. For injectable agents in situations where hand injections are not optimal or feasible, wildlife managers often use remote drug delivery systems, which generally consist of a syringe dart and a dart projector. However, since it may be difficult to access certain wildlife populations on foot or in a vehicle, helicopter, or a fixed-wing aircraft for the purposes of remote drug administration. As you will see in the photo on the bottom right, researchers are starting to test the feasibility of using drones to remotely administer agents to wild animals in rugged and remote landscapes. When conducting fertility control programs, it may be necessary to mark, either temporarily or permanently, animals who have either been surgically sterilized or treated with a fertility control agent. For example, it's common for feral cats to be ear-tipped once they have been spayed or neutered as a way to distinguish them from intact cats in a colony. Tattoos are sometimes used to identify dogs that have been surgically sterilized. Microchips are used in a variety of species to identify them when they are recaptured, as is the case with the sea turtle in the bottom center photo. One potential downside is that, depending on the animal involved, Identification may require recapture because the scanners must be used at a relatively close range. Ear tags are often used as well, but can be damaged or lost over time. Dyes work well when you only need to mark an animal temporarily, but eventually disappear as the animal sheds. And passive integrated transponders or pit tags work well but may only work temporarily depending on the longevity of the animal since the devices stop functioning once the batteries die. However, researchers are constantly exploring new, innovative ways to identify individual animals in the field. For instance, many researchers are starting to examine the potential use of facial recognition technology to identify individual animals in field studies. Despite some limitations of current technology, there are still many, many different practical applications for using these tools to control and manage wildlife reproduction in several different contexts. For example, urban areas are using fertility control to manage pigeons, 
commensal rodents and deer. Zoos and sanctuaries use a wide variety of contraception methods to prevent a surplus of wild animals from being born in captivity. Large coalitions of government and non-governmental organizations are working together all over the world to help address the free-roaming cat and dog overpopulation crisis using fertility control methods. Wild horses, burros, and wild bison and other culturally and historically significant species are managed using fertility control agents in the U.S. and elsewhere. Predator damage control agents are starting to use fertility control on carnivores as a non-lethal method for reducing livestock depredations and restoring prey populations. The fertility control agents are being used to manage introduced and invasive species such as pigeons, Norway rats, and European starlings to name a few. In addition to equids, cervids, bison, commensal rodents, and pigeons, populations of iconic species such as African elephants, kangaroos, and koala bears are also being managed with fertility control programs. The following is a snapshot of just a few of the wildlife fertility control research and management programs that are currently being conducted around the world. Arguably, the field of wildlife fertility control was born of the conundrum of how to manage the historic populations of wild horses and burros that existed and continued to thrive in the American West after the passage of the Wild Free Roaming Wild Horses and Burros Protection Act of 1971. Today, fertility control vaccines like PZP are used to manage wild horse populations on barrier islands, such as Assateague Island National Seashore in Maryland, Shackleford Banks of Cape Lookout National Seashore in North Carolina, and the barrier island town of Corolla on the Outer Banks of North Carolina. PZP is also used to manage wild horses on public lands and herd management areas like the Pryor Mountains in Montana, the Little Brook Cliffs in Colorado, and Moncola Peaks in Wyoming, to name just a few. The fertility control vaccine Gonacon is also used to manage wild horses at Theodore Roosevelt National Park in North Dakota, and fertility control vaccines are used to help manage wild horse populations in several tribal communities throughout the western U.S. This is a series of photos of a wildlife biologist as she goes through the step-by-step -step process of identifying a group of mares in the Samwash Basin herd management area in Colorado who need to be treated, mixing the vaccine, loading a dart projector, treating a mare, and recording the relevant data. Fertility control programs are also being conducted to manage populations of wild horses and burros roaming communities on several islands in the Caribbean, including St. John's, Antigua, and the Puerto Rican island of Vieques. The PZP fertility control vaccine is also used to manage reproduction in the breeding herd of the endangered Przewalski horses at Hordobaji National Park in Hungary. Government agencies and non-governmental organizations in Australia are also considering the use of fertility control vaccines to manage the Brumby or wild horse populations there. Since 1996, researchers have been conducting research on the use of PZP to manage wild African elephant populations in reserves and parks, both large and small, in South Africa. Wildlife managers needed to slow population growth rates to prevent the loss of biodiversity and ecosystem function inside the reserves and to prevent harm to humans and their livelihoods outside the reserves. Today, more than 700 female elephants are treated annually on 34 reserves in South Africa. Research conducted on immunocontraception in elephants over the past 20 years has resulted in a robust body of scientific work demonstrating that the technique is an effective way to control elephant population growth. It is also fully reversible, which allows managers to fine-tune population growth, and has no physical or behavioral side effects. To learn more about this important work, we encourage you to download and review the report featured here titled free-ranging African elephant immunocontraception, a new paradigm for elephant management. The success of the work in South Africa has been covered by several major media outlets and has led wildlife managers in Asia to take the lessons learned in South Africa and apply them to developing and implementing non-lethal management strategies to resolve conflicts between humans and Asian elephants in places like India. In the U.S., deer fertility control programs are becoming more common in urban areas because lethal methods may be illegal, logistically infeasible, unsustainable, socially unacceptable, or all of the above in these densely populated communities. 
The first long-term urban deer immunocontraception study began on Fire Island National Seashore in the 1990s using the PZP vaccine. Since then, several long-term studies using various formulations of PZP have been conducted in other closed or semi-closed systems at the National Institutes for Standards and Technology, or NIST, in Maryland, and Fripp Island, a resort community on the coast of South Carolina. Progress made in these previous studies led to the launch of a five-year study in 2014 in the village of Hastings-on-Hudson, New York, a suburb of New York City, that was the first of its kind. The project was designed to determine the logistics of using a long-acting formulation of the PZP vaccine to manage urban deer in an open system. Studies on the use of the fertility control vaccine Gonacon to manage urban deer have also been conducted in Maryland and in New Jersey. Since 2010, several long-term deer surgical sterilization studies have been launched in urban and suburban communities around the U.S. The most common procedure used is ovariectomies on does. But recently, researchers have also begun studying the effectiveness of conducting vasectomies on bucks. The first was in Baltimore County, Maryland, but since then, several new studies have been initiated in California, Virginia, Maryland, New York, Ohio, Missouri, and Michigan. In 2013, a retirement community in San Jose, California called The Villages initiated a deer surgical sterilization program. In the same year, Fairfax City, Virginia also launched a multi-year deer surgical sterilization program. In 2014, the National Institutes of Health, NIH, in Bethesda, Maryland, launched a deer surgical sterilization program on their campuses. And in 2015, residents of Clifton, a small urban community in downtown Cincinnati, Ohio, raised the funds to initiate a five-year deer surgical sterilization study to determine the efficacy of conducting ovariectomies on a high proportion of the community's does to reduce the population. Other study sites included Ann Arbor, Michigan, Cuyahoga Heights, New York, East Hampton, New York, and Town and Country, Missouri. So in the past, most urban deer fertility control studies have been designed to contracept or sterilize a high proportion of the community's female deer to reduce the population growth rates. However, in 2016, the same researchers who led the aforementioned studies on sterilizing does via ovariectomies launched a project on Staten Island, New York that's the first of its kind. This study is designed to determine if vasectomizing a high proportion of the community's buck population will stabilize and reduce the population. We hope to share the results of these ongoing deer fertility control studies in future webinars once the researchers publish their findings. For years, urban rat management programs have focused on using traps and rodenticides to kill rats as a primary means of population control. The problem is that not only are these programs indiscriminate and inhumane, the immediate effect on the population is short-lived. The surviving rodents reproduce at an exponential rate due to reduced competition for available resources, and as a result, the population quickly rebounds. To provide pest control operators with a new tool to incorporate into their integrated rodent management programs, the company SenseTech has worked through laboratory and field studies to develop an oral contraceptive for rats called ContraPest, a highly attractive liquid contraceptive bait that, with repeated consumption, is effective in reducing rat populations in a variety of settings. Today, ContraPest is being incorporated into rat management programs in large metropolitan areas like Chicago and Washington, D.C. The company Analytics developed a ready-to-use bait called OvaControl with an active ingredient known as micarbazin that interferes with the reproduction of treated birds, causing the population to decline over time through attrition. This effective and humane technology is especially useful for managing pigeon flocks in larger areas without having to resort to traps, poisons, and other lethal methods. Today, this technology is incorporated into pigeon management programs around the world in countries like the U.S., Spain, and Australia. And in addition to pigeons, OvaControl has also been approved for use in managing several other bird species, including European starlings, red-winged blackbirds, yellow-headed blackbirds, brewer's blackbird, the common grackle, boat-tailed grackles, great-tailed grackles, brown-headed cowbirds, bronze cowbirds, and common minor birds. 
Authorities in Australia have teamed up with researchers to conduct a multi-year study with the goal of developing effective remote delivery systems for treating the urban kangaroo population in the Australian Capital Territory with the fertility control vaccine Gonacon. And on the western plains of Victoria in southeastern Australia, researchers have conducted the largest real-world trial using a hormonal implant known as Norplant to treat female kangaroos. The effort has successfully brought down kangaroo numbers in Victoria, removing the need to cull them. In November 2017, the Kangaroo Island Koala Management Project surgically sterilized 475 female koalas as part of an ongoing effort to stabilize and reduce the population there. Fertility control remains the primary koala management tool in South Australia, as culling is not permitted in any state in Australia. Off the coast of California, Researchers worked with the Catalina Island Conservancy to develop a program for managing the wild bison population there using the fertility control vaccine PZP. Researchers in the UK are working together with conservationists to develop an oral contraceptive and delivery system for managing North American gray squirrels. The non-native population of gray squirrels is outcompeting the native red squirrel populations for available habitat and resources. Wildlife managers in southern Africa are restoring prey populations in parks and reserves by using fertility control to manage African lion population growth rates. And wildlife managers and researchers in India, China, South Africa, and elsewhere are exploring options for using fertility control to manage urban primates such as macaques, baboons, and vervet monkeys. In conclusion, over the years, a wide array of contraception and sterilization methods have been developed and field tested for both free-roaming wildlife and feral populations of animals. Significant progress has been made in the development of agents, identification, and delivery systems, but some challenges remain, mainly related to the need for the development of longer-acting agents, new identification and delivery systems, data on feasibility, logistics, and associated costs, and replicable model programs. These challenges must be surmounted in order to supply the increasing demand from the public and wildlife managers for effective non-lethal wildlife population management tools. We hope you've enjoyed this webinar on the current state of the field of wildlife fertility control. If you'd like to learn more about fertility control and wild equids, we invite you to attend the upcoming free roaming horse and burrow fertility control workshop in Albuquerque, New Mexico, on Thursday, November 8, 2018. For more information about the workshop, please contact Monique Principe, the Managing Director of the Botstever Institute for Wildlife Fertility Control at mprincipe at botstever.org. And if you have questions about any of the information contained in this presentation or about wildlife fertility control in general, feel free to contact me using the information listed here. Thank you again for participating in the webinar. At this time, I'll be happy to take your questions. Can everybody hear me? Okay, you can hear, you can hear me now. Okay, great. So I'm gonna re-answer um, Mike's question about uh, fertility control and black bears. So uh, just in case people did not hear me the first time, so to the best of my knowledge, there aren't any trials on black bears, although there are several wild, uh, wildlife fertility control agents and methods that would uh, work. Um, one of the reasons I believe that it, it has not been used is because black bear populations are generally limited by the resources available to them. And uh, so uh, wildlife fertility control would not necessarily be a, the, the best uh, means of, of human conflict a resolution, site-specific mitigation methods are usually the best with respect to resolving conflicts with black bears, but that's not to say that there may not be a role for using fertility control in some, some particular situation. I'm just not aware of any, but we'll look into that for you and get back to you. The next question is, what is stopping agencies like the BLM from using PZP for wild horses? Well, the BLM is using the, uh, PZP and other fertility control methods and vaccines on wild horses. I think there are um, advocacy groups that believe they should be doing more of it, um, but they are using it in some. The two, th two or three examples that I gave are just a, um, a handful of places where the BLM and other federal agencies are using fertility control methods to manage wild horses, but I think the 
the overall um, uh, idea is that we want them to expand the use of it to the, the extent that they can. And we are trying to help with that by hosting the workshop uh, next, next month in uh, Albuquerque, New Mexico. Um, let's see here. Uh, the next question is, uh, thank you for the summary. What is the efficacy of GONACON in horses? That's a great question. Um, it's my understanding that the first year, and I'm not, I can't give you statistics right now, but the first year, the, the, the vaccine works relatively well, but like, a, like other vaccines, without boosting the animals, the, the, the reproductive rate will, will start to go up again. What I can do is put you in touch with the folks at the National Park Service that are doing work. Uh, at Theodore Roosevelt National Park on Gonacon, they would be able to provide you with the best um, uh, statistics on the efficacy of Gonacon in horses over time. Okay, and I hope I'm not uh, skipping over anybody. Do you have any information on the impacts of this contraception and then uh, on, aside from vaccine sterilization and oral, yeah, I'm not able to, for some reason, I'm not able to read the, the rest of your, um, your question, Catherine Hood. Um, just scrolling through here. Okay, the next question is, is there a way I can get a copy of this webinar to show to our group, Citizen Advocates for Animals, at our November meeting? We are working against the TTP program where our deer are baited, trapped, and killed for population management. We hope to get approval for a non-lethal method of uh, managing our deer, deer population. Uh, the answer to that question is yes, you will be able to get a copy of it and, and you'll, it will be posted on our website within the next few weeks. And I think those are all the questions that we've received so far from anybody. If you have another one, it looks like audio is working now and um, we should be able to take your uh, questions. We have about 25 minutes left. We've got a couple coming in. So the next question is, has there ever been a long-term study comparing the safety and efficacy of PZP, Gonacon, and Spavac in captive or wild deer or captive or wild horses to determine the strengths and weaknesses of each fertility control agent? It's a great question. And to the best of my knowledge, that study has not been conducted, but it would be a great one. Um, because there, I think there are a lot of independent studies that have been done on these three agents, but uh, to the best of my knowledge, there has not been one that compared the efficacy of all of them in either a captive or wild setting. So that's a great question. The next question is, and I think I've already answered this one, I apologize. So waiting for some other questions to come in. And I'm going to re-answer a question that I answered at the beginning of the Q&A session just because I'm afraid the audio uh, went out on us and I'm not sure that listeners were able to hear my answer. Um, the question was, do you have any information on the me mental or psychological impacts of treating animals like African elephants with, uh, with immunocontraception vaccine? And my question was that I myself am not aware of any, but that my uh, colleague and peer, Audrey Delsink, um, who was the uh, primary author of that report that I referenced in the webinar earlier, she would be able to answer your question. So I will, uh, after the webinar, I will be sure to share her contact information with you so you can uh, get an answer to that question. And then the next question is, 
can you share information on grant funding opportunities for contraception supported by the uh, Institute? So yes, if you go to our website on the top navigation bar, you will see a, um, a tab for grants. If you click on the grants tab, you will see the guidelines that we follow for, uh, for, for uh, providing grants. And the grants right now focus mostly on public policy and education projects, uh, but please do go to our website to learn more about our grant opportunities. And the next question is, where can I learn more about fertility control treatment of white-tailed deer? Well, there are several different um, researchers that are conducting uh, research on, on white-tailed deer fertility control. One is a nonprofit organization called White Buffalo Incorporated. They are the researchers that are doing a lot of the work on surgical sterilization, both ovariectomies and vasectomies in urban areas. Another a resource for information on uh, immunocontraception is um, the Humane Society of the United States. Um, you can also uh, contact researchers at Tufts University that are conducting research on the immunocontraception vaccine and different formulations of it, PZP. Um, uh, there are researchers at the National Wildlife Research Center in Fort Collins that are also uh, constantly looking for new uh, and innovative ways to conduct fertility control uh, programs on wildlife in the United States and elsewhere. Um, so if you go to our website, there's quite a bit of information in our repository and in our uh, previous events, conferences and workshops that we've held um, specifically on fertility control for white-tailed deer. We had one in Terrytown, New York this past spring. So to get started, that might be a really good way to get started is by uh, checking out the uh, presentations from that workshop that we had in uh, Terrytown this past spring. Got a couple of more questions coming in. The next question is, is PZP active for up to four years in deer? Does research continue to extend its efficacy so that maybe boosters will not be needed? So at this time, um, the, the best answer that I can give to you is some of the, the literature that has been published on the work that was done on Fripp Island. That was one of the, um, the studies that I mentioned in the webinar. So I highly recommend reaching out to uh, Dr. Alan Rutberg at uh, Tufts University uh, for information about that study and the ongoing study in Hastings on Hudson, New York. They're using PZP22, which as I said before, is a longer acting formulation of the Zonistat H vaccine. Um, and I will tell you that um, the Humane Society of the United States that I know is working with Purdue University to come up with a longer acting version of the PZP vaccine, even longer acting than PZP22 that uh, can be used in wild horses, deer, and other animals where PZP is effective. Um, that work is ongoing, it's, it's in its infancy, um, but my understanding is the goal of that research is to come up with an even more effective, longer acting version of the PZP vaccine. Are there any other questions? Okay, if there are no other questions, we're going to end the webinar now. As I said during the um, presentation, um, I've included my contact information. Oh, wait a minute, we have another one. Uh, do you know whether there are any control agents under development for mongoose species? Um, I believe so, and I can look that up for you and get back in touch with you. But yes, I do believe that there are uh, uh, more than one uh, control agent that uh, there's some research and development on uh, testing it in captive mongoose uh, populations and then using it in wild free roaming mongoose populations.
any other questions? We still have about 20 minutes, so we have plenty of time if any of you have questions. Okay, if there are no additional questions, I wanna thank everyone for participating. Oh, we have another one, I apologize. Uh, aside from vaccines, sterilization and oral contraception, are there other control methods? Not that I'm aware of. Um, the, the immunocontraception vaccines and sterilization methods and the oral contraceptive methods are the ones that I'm aware of um, and that we have been able to identify in the literature that's available. But I will say that um, researchers, uh, innovators are constantly coming up with new approaches to, um, uh, to uh, conducting fertility control programs in animals, not just wildlife. And we're trying to learn uh, from fertility control efforts in other animals to uh, repurpose those for uh, applications in wildlife where it's appropriate um, and it would be effective an effective way to do so. But those are the three that we're most familiar with and then are used most widely um, as a practical application. There's a lot of cool research going on right now. Spavac, so we have a question on what Spavac is. Um, Spavac is a um, immunocontraception vaccine that uses PZP as a component, but it also uses a technology using liposomes to release the PZP over time. Um, and if you want to learn more about SPAVAC, I highly recommend people visit SPAVAC uh, for Wildlife. Uh, that's their website to learn more about, uh, about that technology. Please keep the questions coming. They're, they're very good. So please, please don't hesitate to ask anything that you wish. Okay, if there are no other questions, although every time I say that, then a one pops up. So maybe me just saying that will prompt somebody to ask another question. But if not, um, please don't hesitate to reach out to me uh, today or um, after you've had a chance to think about some of what was presented today. You can reach me at sboyles, B-O-Y-L-E-S, at humanesociety.org. Um, Okay, so we just got a question, what programs are in Maryland? Um, there have been some previous programs in Maryland. Um, as I said during the presentation, there was a surgical sterilization program that was conducted in um, Baltimore County. Um, and from what I understand, there was a GONACON study that was conducted uh, on a federal agency uh, campus um, just outside the DC metro area a few years back. That was a research project that was conducted on sort of a semi-closed system there. And then another project that was conducted in Maryland was the research project on PZP uh, at the National Institutes for Standards and Technology in Gaithersburg, Maryland. Uh, those are the three projects that I know of. And, the, and the, the fourth, of course, was the project that was conducted at the National Institutes of Health, and that was a surgical sterilization project. I think those are the four that I know of that were conducted in um, Maryland. Okay, we just had another question come in. State wildlife agency officials frequently claim that PZP causes an extension of the reproductive season in deer, thereby potentially resulting in the birth of fawns outside the normal birthing period and during winter when they may not be able to survive. Can you comment on this claim? And in particular, if this can occur, what is the effect uh, to the population? And is there a difference between southern states and uh, versus northern states. 
Um, so uh, there is no doubt that when a, a doe does not get pregnant, that they will continue to cycle for a period of time. But um, that, you know, to say that it causes an extension in the, in the reproductive season, to the best of my knowledge, it does not. Again, the person that probably has the best, uh, the best um, uh, viewpoint on this, because he's done so many of these projects with various uh, deer populations in both the northern United States and then down in the south at Pope Island is Dr. Alan Rutberg with Tufts University. Um, but I, I honestly cannot comment on whether the it occurs more uh, frequently in southern states or northern states. But again, I strongly recommend uh, that if you want um, an answer to that question that you reach out to Dr. Rutberg. And then another question we had come in, um, not a question, but here's the title to a 2006 paper on fertility control in blackbirds that may help respond to the question asked earlier, an analysis of the feasibility of using fertility control to manage New Jersey black bear populations. It is available on ResearchGate and may be available via uh, Google search. So thank you, DJ Schubert, for that information. Um, I think that uh, the person that asked that question may have already logged off, but we can see who that was and we will send that information to him following the webinar. So the next question is, any immunocontraception vaccine available or successful in rhesus macaques? That's a great question. Uh, it's my understanding that some researchers in Hong Kong have been working on uh, using fertility control to reduce conflicts between humans and macaques there in some uh, highly densely populated urban areas. And it's my understanding that they tried to use a uh, fertility control vaccine that was just mentioned a few min minutes ago, uh, Spayback, and did not have the desired amount of success that they were looking for. And so they have recently begun a rapid surgical sterilization process that seems to be working quite well there. Um, they've been able to treat over 80% of their target population, and they've been working on it for about 10 years. So there is some information on surgical uh, sterilization for macaques, but we're not aware of uh, an immunocontraception program. There's probably some research going on there, and that's great, um, but um, the only successful practical application that we know of to date is the program in Hong Kong. See here another question. Is there any data available on projected cost of achieving effective population control or having eradication in sight based on time frame, population size, density, land area, and based on species? So that's a great question. And it's one of the outstanding questions that we, we uh, refer to at the end of our presentation. Uh, just finding out if a vaccine will work and it can be effective in a uh, free roaming population of animals is just the beginning of our work in trying to expand the use of these agents and methods to free roaming populations of wild animals. We have to get a, we have to start doing some work on the logistics and associated costs with doing this. So that's a need. Um, there's some work that's been done in a few species, but that is a, uh, a need that needs to be met in most of the practical practical application projects that are currently being conducted. And then another question that just came in is any idea of the cost for PZP per deer? So we know that the cost of uh, uh, Zonostat H or Zonostat D per deer is around $30 um, a dose, but it's important that that cost be, um, be combined and coupled with the costs that are associated with having to locate the animal, to administer the dart, to locate the dart. Um, so uh, to the best of my knowledge, there are no published studies on the cost per deer using uh, the Zonostat D uh, uh, vaccine. Um, and to the best of my knowledge, we don't have published costs on what it costs per deer to treat deer with another formulation of PZP called PZP-22. But again, it's my understanding that researchers are working on, um, on developing uh, the data uh, that would give us an idea of what the cost per deer would be uh, for treating animals with, with PZP, Zonostat D, or PZP-22.
So uh, we just had a, a question, any ideas for getting funding for fertility control? Well, you know, there are a lot of different uh, foundations um, and grant making uh, organizations that uh, researchers can uh, go to to get their, their research funded. Right now, the Bob Stever Institute is funding grants on public policy and education as it relates to fertility control. So an example of something like that would be um, before even implementing a fertility control program or research project in the community, there should be some sort of proper stakeholder analysis done to make sure that uh, the community is on board with using this um, or studying it as a means of population control for a given wildlife population. Um, and to make sure that uh, the messaging for it is appropriate for the community that's gonna be used. So that would be an example of a project that's related to wildlife fertility control that um, uh, a, um, a grantee could request a grant from the Botstever Institute to support. It's very easy to do that. Um, all we require is a letter of intent describing the project that's related to wildlife fertility control that you're interested in receiving support for. But again, I highly re recommend that um, everyone, if you're interested in, in funding opportunities through the, the Institute, uh, to check out our website at www.wildlifefertilitycontrol.org and then go to our grants tab to uh, read through our grant uh, guidelines. And if you have any questions about the guidelines, please feel free to contact my colleague, Monique Principe at mprincipe at botstever.org. Next question. Um, PZP is illegal in Texas. Will there be efforts to get compliance from state agencies so PZP can be used in small communities? Um, that depends on the, um, the, the providers that want to offer it to communities. It's really up to the, um, the, the people that supply PZP and that um, want to assist communities in using it to um, get compliance from the state. So what they would have to do is um, get the product registered with the state um, uh, agriculture department. Uh, because it's already been registered with the EPA. So each state uh, can or, or may choose not to register a particular um, fertility control vaccine for wildlife in their state. For instance, um, several states in the West have registered Zonostat H for use in wild horses as they have uh, Gonacon. Um, and there are a couple of states where Gonacon is registered for use in white-tailed deer, such as Maryland and New Jersey. Um, to the best of my knowledge, it has not been registered in Texas, but that doesn't mean it won't be. And then the next question is, are there any, are any of these methods currently employed for control of feral dog and cat populations, urban or otherwise, but especially where um, having a negative impact on native wildlife. So there's an organization that is dedicated solely to uh, advancing and promoting and finding non-surgical ways of reducing cat and dog populations around the world through non-surgical means. Um, and that's, that's a, an organization called ACC and D um, the Alliance for Contraception in Cats and Dogs. And um, the, uh, these methods are being used in su certain situations. For instance, I know Gonacon has been used on dog populations in the past, but because they, they have not been able to find a non-surgical agent that will work on both female and male cats and dogs yet, um, surgical sterilization is still the primary tool for uh, managing uh, feral dog and cat populations worldwide. But there's an effort, a very strong one, by this, uh, this alliance of organizations to find non-surgical agents that can be used to manage the, the cat and dog populations. Great question. And then, uh, let's see here. What are the feasible options available for free range blue bulls 
um, for fertility control. So one project that um, is being conducted in Hong Kong as well is a, a project on feral livestock, um, uh, feral cattle specifically. And I know that they are using Gonacon and that the preliminary results of that study have been very positive. So I would be happy to put you in touch with some of the lead uh, principal investigators on that study that would be able to provide you with information on the use of Gonacon and maybe some other options. I believe that PZP would probably work because it's work, it does work on bovine, uh, uh, bison and other bovine species. But uh, to be sure, I'd want to put you in touch with the, uh, the folks at the Science and Conservation Center in uh, Billings, Montana. And like I said, uh, the principal investigators of that study on feral cattle in Hong Kong. Any other questions? We have about three minutes left. Any other questions? Like I said, we have about two minutes left. Okay, if there are no other questions, um, we're going to uh, close the webinar for today. Thank you all so much for participating. Um, and just so you know, we will be having a webinars in the, in the future on, um, on other issues related to wildlife fertility control. This was an overview of what's going on with the state of the field today. Uh, but future webinars will, will focus on new uh, research that's being conducted on animals around the world and some of the practical application projects that we reported on today. We hope to share uh, the findings of them once the researchers uh, publish them. So thank you again for joining us and uh, we hope to see you back here for a future webinar. Thank you. <laughs>